Hello everyone, this is Jeff from the Ozark Mountains in Missouri, USA. Today we have a special treat. A few weeks ago, a viewer sent me a box of 1980s computer goodness to take a look at, and in that box were two of these. A convergent work slate. If you've never heard of the work slate before, that's not surprising because they were only on the market for about six months and only about 5,000 were ever made. Before diving right in and fixing these up, let's have a look at Convergent Technologies, the company who made these, and see what their product line was and maybe what prompted them to come out with the work slate. Let's have a look. Convergent Technologies was formed by a small group of people who left Intel in Xerox Park in 1979. Their product line consisted of multiprocessor systems, workstations, PCs, and related accessories. Their first product was the integrated workstation tower based on the Intel 8086 microprocessor. Then came a cost-reduced desktop version called the Advanced Workstation. Both used their own proprietary operating system known as Convergent Technologies Operating System, CTOS. A unique feature was the ability to network these workstations in an RS-422 clustered environment. Convergent also used the Motorola 68010, 68020, and 68040 in their mini frame and mighty frame workstations, which used the CITX CITX operating system. The AWS was eventually replaced by the next generation NGEN system, which made use of the Intel 8186 processor. It eventually advanced up to the 8386 under Convergent and eventually the 8486 after Convergent was purchased by Unisys. Convergent also made workstations for AT&T, such as the AT&T PC7300, as well as other companies such as Motorola, Burroughs, Prime Computer, and McDonnell Douglas Computer Systems, known later as Microdata. In 1986, they were poised to buy out 3Com, but the deal fell through at the last minute, and then in 1988, the company was purchased by Unisys and became their networking division. So these high-end and high-dollar workstation systems and their corresponding operating system was their core business. A laptop or portable computer targeted at the business consumer sector seems like an odd choice. The marketing and distribution channels for such a product would be completely different than the direct sales that they would have been doing in the past. This is a similar situation that HP found themselves in when they brought out the first pocket scientific calculator. Convergent was squarely aiming for the business market. It was designed for those who wanted a business tool and didn't want to learn about computers. The work slate was introduced about the same time as the Tandy Model 100. It's about the same footprint as the Model 100, but the work slate is noticeably thinner and lighter. However, the work slate is far less flexible than the Model 100 and is primarily a spreadsheet machine. Henry Ford said that you could have a Model T in any color you wanted as long as it was black and the work slate falls into that same category. You can run any software you want as long as it's a spreadsheet. The work slate uses a Hitachi 6309 processor, which is a CMOS version of the Motorola 6809. That's the same processor that was used in the Radio Shack color computers and the Dragon computers back in the day. The 6309 is a little faster and it has some other improvements. The work slate came with 16K of RAM, which couldn't be extended, and allowed a maximum of 720 cell spreadsheets to be filled. Convergent also offered a small printer that hooks directly to the work slate, or you could get an add-on serial and parallel port unit that plugs into the same uh, expansion port as the printer. The LCD is 46 by 16 characters and has pretty good contrast for an LCD of this age. The work slate was sold through the American Express Christmas catalog in 1983 and it stopped sales the following July in 1984. This would seem to indicate that Convergent was just trying to dump the units they had already built. 
While Convergent planned to sell 200,000 units per year, only 5,000 systems were ever sold in the U.S., plus a few hundred in Europe. It's reported that Convergent lost about $15 million on this project. Now that we know a little bit about Convergent and the work slate, let's take a close-up look at it. Notice how the keyboard has some color-coded function keys. The special key and the options key are color-coded. And there are some soft keys under the LCD. A numeric keypad, and notice it has a do it key instead of enter and four separate buttons for cursor control. The keyboard is better than a membrane keyboard, but it's a far cry from something like the Model 100. And notice that the cassette deck only has one mechanical button, the eject button. Everything else is controlled by the computer itself. If we take a look at the front, there's no additional connectors or anything on there. On the right hand side we have the volume and microphone and headphone input and you can see that the function names are embossed on the bottom. On the rear we have the two phone connections, power and peripherals. And again the names are embossed below. And on the left hand side we have the contrast for the LCD. On the bottom, you can see that there is a kickstand to put it at a better angle for viewing and typing. And we have the main battery compartment and the memory backup batteries compartment. And here we have a close-up of the embossed names and everything. They did a really good job on that. The whole thing has a quality feel to it. It's solid, it's not creaky, it doesn't twist, etc. And there is a system reset button which takes everything back to factory defaults. And here's a close-up of the sticker for all you sticker fans. If we lift up the kickstand and we can open the main battery compartment, you'll see here that it can take four AA batteries. If we take a good look at the battery contacts, we can see they look a little oxidized. And if we look at it from the other direction, oh, there we go. You can see there's a funny third contact in the middle, and that was part of what was needed if you were using the rechargeable NICAD battery pack. For the sake of completeness, let's go ahead and take a look at the memory battery compartment. Here we go. With the two batteries installed, it'll retain the memory for about a week. Here is a bit of a close-up on the LCD. It really does have pretty good contrast for an LCD of this era. Here's the work slate badge. Now let's take a look at that cassette mechanism. If we eject it and get everything rotated around here, we can get a better view. You can see the pinch roller is stuck out and it shouldn't be that way. And you can't really hear in the background, but you can hear a slight motor running noise, which makes me think that it's trying to retract it. Now let's get to the fun part start taking this apart and see if we can't fix this cassette mechanism. The first thing I want to check is to see if this door is somehow clipped on here and needs to come off first before we separate the bottom. And if I look under here, the middle part of the hinge is part of the cassette mechanism proper. It does feel like this that might be glued on there, but I'm not convinced it needs to come out ahead of time. But I'll we'll have to see. And I've already taken the batteries out. And it looks like all the screws are around here. These don't come off. Oh, there's one screw right there too. There's nothing in either battery compartment. That might 
don't see any screws in there. Okay. Nope, that just lifted up quite easy. It looks like here, here, and here there's some catches. Can't really see though. Okay, that just kind of rotates off. That looks kind of nicely done. I'll set that aside. That is the system reset button. Microphone. Lots of surface mount stuff. And here's our cassette mechanism here. So we got some copper foil on top of plastic shielding here. There's a screw here and there's a screw there. Okay, those are both the same size. Well, I don't see any other screws here. Let's give that a try. Okay. Now it feels like this whole cassette mechanism wants to come out with it. your mouth just right you can get that door to release there a couple ribbon cables here okay so I'm just gonna set this to the oh can't set that all the way to the side so I need to release these ribbons okay this is kind of a funky ribbon connector Wow, there are a whole slew of bodge wires on this board. Okay, I'll get you a close up on all this stuff now. Okay, a little different setup here. I'm trying a wide angle lens that I'm using the microphone built into the camera. This is the display board. And this masking tape is on there from the factory. This is the keyboard part, the keyboard ribbon cable, display ribbon cable. Notice this funky ribbon connector there. Here's our battery compartment. See that just kind of pushes down on the board. But we should be able to get to those contacts nice and easy now and clean them up. And here is the cassette mechanism. And notice there's some type of metal bracket that's slotted and attached there. So that looks like some sort of an adjustment. Oh, that's the that's the eject mechanism. How interesting. Okay. Notice a plethora of bodge wires on here. Imagine these big Toyota coils are part of a switch mode power supply. A couple crystals. Get some memory over here. Mask room, I suspect. Or bodge wires. Capacitors look okay. Then we're up to our cassette mechanism. Huh. Get a few big chunky resistors in here. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, this whole side down here, this all looks like memory chips. Room for an extra ROM in there, maybe. 
6303, that's the processor. That's going to be some type of system ASIC. So, well, what's on the other side of our board? We've already seen this. I don't think I'm going to take the cover off here. don't think we'll take that off because we don't need to. A whole pile of passives and a few transistors on this side too. So let's have a look at that cassette mechanism. Okay, just for fun, I've left the wide angle lens on the camera to see if it gives us a better shot of working on this. Got some wires coming off the read right head. This is some rather dubious soldering there. There is a motor here, which no doubt drives this mechanism. I can see some gears that's going up to the pinch roller. And there's some other cables coming off the read right head, which are going down to this part of the circuit. Another bodge wire that looks like it's connecting grounds together. A capacitor bodged in there. And this looks like the spindle motor here. And we have a speaker here. And it looked like this board for the cassette mechanism is made to come out. Had some hand touch up there from the factory. There's a part here marked Q56, which is pointed at the spindle shaft. And this looks like maybe there's some magnets in here. Yeah, that's how it's keeping track of the tape position. It has an electronic tape counter. Yeah, it's had several nick traces fixed at the factory. Okay, so this motor is driving some gears here, which is moving the pinch roller. Yeah, that pinch roller's definitely got flat spotted. Still not clear exactly what's driving that. See, there's a little tiny switch right here, which seems to be keeping track of where those gears are. Oh, I see the just right there. There is a belt. Okay. I think I'm going to have to study this a bit. Okay, there is a yellow and gray wire which comes off, oops, yellow and gray wire which comes off the right side of the read right head, which goes down to the board. And we have a missing inductor of an unknown value, which is problematic. On the back, we even have more cassette mechanism wires. There's a, there's a little blue wire, which goes here. It's the upper one of those two that are together. And it's got a device on the back of the motor here. These wires aren't marked as to which is which, but I'll mark a black one on what looks like it goes to, I'll put a black mark here which looks like it goes to ground. My guess is that is some type of encoder. Got the cassette, I've got the cassette mechanism out and I've hooked up my bench power supply to the mechanism motor here. Got the power supply set on 2 volts, about 500 milliamps. And you can watch when I power it, it'll run the mechanism up and down. It cycles through there. It's operated via cam and this little switch here tells the controller what position it's in. I'm going to turn the power supply on. So that part is working okay. but it's still not pulling the pin controller back and I can't tell, I can't see 
this, I can't tell what's supposed to connect this pin controller to this mechanism here. If we look at the back, I pulled the circuit board off, that bracket and two screws, and we can get to the belt now. The belt is pretty worn out. Let's see, it's got some, oops, it's got some bins in it there. It's going to be replaced. Oh, you can see this was made November 2nd of 83. No idea what mechanism this is. And this little switch on the back appears to be the door closed switch. It's grounded out by part of the door mechanism when the door is closed. So, and I've spun this by hand and it spins freely. So looks like there's a screw here to get into that mechanism. And a screw on top, but I'm not sure which to take apart first. I guess we'll see. Here is the mechanism motor. It's just a little worm gear. And it's got a... It's got this worm gear here. Driving this spur gear. And there is a little uh, cam here that runs the mechanism in and out. I don't know if you can see it, but right there is a little gear damage. It's still got enough gear there that it works, but I bet that was a result of trying to get a taper in or out when that pinch roller was stuck. Now here we have the pinch roller, and I still can't tell what is supposed to move it with the mechanism, but with the motor out. We can pull this change hands here. We can activate this manually. And that's the full range of motion. You can see it's not pulling that pin controller. But notice right here, you see a little divot in there. I'm wondering if there is something on the bottom of this piece that's catching in this piece. There's something on the bottom of here that's supposed to catch in that hole in here and pull that back and forth. I'll have to figure out how to pop that off of there to see. There is our broken off part. That's a little pin that went on the bottom of the pin controller arm. That sat in that slot and pulled the pinch roller back. Problem is, this thing is really not made to be repaired. I took the little flywheel off here to get to the belt. I'll flip this over and show you the other side. On this side, this pinch roller looks like it is pressed onto this shaft. And without some special type of tool, a puller to pull that off there, you'd have to grip under this edge while... Where is it tight? Huh, I thought that was pressed in there. Oh, I can see that's loose now. Excuse me while I go fetch my dog. Okay, this is kind of hard to see. But, right there, right below my fingernail, there's some type of little retaining ring. That's what keeps that pin controller arm on that shaft. I just have to figure out how to pop that out of there without launching it across the room. Okay, and there is the retaining ring. That was below the spring on that pin controller arm. Now I think I should be able to pull that guy off of there. I don't think I'm going to be able to do it one-handed though. Okay, here is the orientation of the spring inside the pin controller. And right there is where that little nub was. I managed to dig it out of there so I'll measure the diameter. Figure out how to drill a hole in that spot and put something else in there. 
Here is that little broken off nub. I stuck it to a piece of tape and I'll fold the tape over to keep from losing it and I'll put it in the bucket there with the I guess it's not a bucket little container with the screws and I measured the little nub with some dial calipers made myself a little sketch it's slightly oblong and yeah, that's in thousands of an inch or mils I have to come up with something that's about that right size I don't know which orientation that was in as far as the 045 versus 030 yeah, the 050 is the height I'm not really sure that matter so I'm guessing I could get somewhere around a millimeter in diameter and it would be good enough. We're out in my tiny single car garage workshop with my trusty little tech manual lathe and we're going to make a part for a vintage computer or actually I guess more precisely we're going to repair a part. Remember the micro cassette deck from the work slate had this pinch roller that had a little nub here and so how would it go about fixing that? Well, what I'm going to do is put this on my lathe. This is called a blank arbor and it simply is drilled and threaded to fit the spindle nose. Face it, you know, take a little off the front of it to make sure it's flat and I'll drill and tap that for a number 080 screw which is about oh, a millimeter and a half an outside diameter. And then I will, uh, using the lathe, cut down the threads in one area so the diameter is smooth and about one millimeter. And I can take that modified screw out of there and drill and tap the correct place in the pinch roller, thread the screw in, and cut off the head of the screw leaving only a millimeter of a round shaft sticking out. That's the plan so let's get started and see if it'll work out. Okay I've tried to get you a good view here. Excuse my boarding house reach. I'm gonna wipe a little cutting oil on there and we'll turn on the lathe and it's gonna be noisy. But I'm just gonna take just a wee bit off of there to make sure that surface is flat. That's better. Now we've got a nice smooth face. Back the tool way off. Slide the drill chuck up here and put some cutting fluid on the drill. Now, what I'm going to try to do is drill in there, oh, maybe two millimeters, eighty thousandths of an inch, somewhere like that, and then we'll tap that to hold our zero eighty screw. That's about two. Okay. Now we've got our drilling done. Okay, so now we're going to take apart this tailstock here a bit. There we go. And we'll put in a live center. And a live center, just a little spring loaded point. Okay, so we've got our drilled out blank arbor and we put the life center in here, which is the springy pointy bit. And I've got a 0-80 tap, which is teeny tiny, and my tap holder, which has a little point right in the center of it. So the idea here is Put this on here like this, slide that up like so, so it puts a little pressure on the tap handle and keeps it centered because tapping these small holes is very difficult. Some more cutting fluid. I don't know if you can see the color of the cutting fluid, it looks kind of milky. It's a, 
water soluble vegetable oil based cutting fluid. Five half turns, six half turns, seven half turns. Back it up to break the chips. And it's feeling like I hit the bottom of the hole. So we will back the tap out of there now. If I have a Allen wrench small enough to work with that guy. It is only in there about three turns. I'm not quite sure that's deep enough. I only need about a millimeter of threads on the end. Just color that with a marker. Pull the screw back out to double check. Yep, you know, there is about a millimeter of threads there, which is all we need. Those are the threads that will screw into the pinch roller arm. Now we're going to adjust our life center again. Slide it down as far as we can. Okie duck. I have changed the style of tool holder there because the the quick change tool holder, why it's very handy, was well, far too large. And this is the type that takes ships with the machine. And you notice some high tech paper here that I've used to shim up this right handed cutting bit so it's on the center line of the screw. We've got our 080 screw in here that you can just see using this spring loaded life center. To put just a tiny bit of pressure on the back of the screw and that just keeps it from wanting to wobble when we're cutting on it. And the idea here is that we're going to cut the threads off of this screw for about a length of a millimeter or two. We really just need one millimeter but it doesn't matter. And to start out with, that is the diameter of the screw, about 60 thousandths of an inch which is right at a millimeter and a half. We want to take that down to one millimeter, so we don't have a lot to cut off there. Just about half a millimeter. So, a little cutting fluid on there. I'll start the lathe up and see if we can get this done. You probably can't hear that. I can hear it just made contact with the screw threads. And I can see the shininess, which means I'm just making contact with the tip of the thread. This dial here is calibrated. Okay. So I can still just see some thread on there, so we're not quite deep enough. Measure that to be sure. I'll be right in front of the camera here. So now we've taken about oh seven thousandths off of there, so got a little more to go. First rule of machining is measure, measure, measure. Okay, right there, I am right at between 39 and 40 thousandths, and a millimeter is 39.7 thousandths, so I think we've got it licked. Now, the next part of the puzzle will be to drill and tap a hole in the right place in the pinch roller arm. Okay, there you go. So. See, we've just trimmed the threads off there. We have our threads on the end and the smooth shaft, and we'll screw that into the hole in the pinch roller arm with some Loctite. Let the Loctite sit up, and then we'll trim off a one millimeter long nub on the end. To drill the hole, we're going to use the CNC mill 
Now, one issue with this little uh, pinch roller arm is that the position where we need to drill this hole uh, in order to tap it is right on the edge of the vertical piece here. So when the, the bit would hit the inside wall of the vertical piece, it would have a tendency to want to deflect and break the bit. So instead of using a drill, I've got a one millimeter stub end mill in here. And we're going to use that to drill a hole uh, since it's got a flat tip and it's cutting by going around in a circle and it's stiffer than a drill bit, it won't have that problem. And we can get our hole through there and then tap our uh, 0.80 hole and get ready to thread in our screw fix. Here we go. just has the same size holes as the shank of the tap and it just helps keep it up there vertically. Put a little tapping fluid on things. Stop the tap in the hole. And go nice and slow. So we got the the hole machined in there and tapped. Uh, for the number 0, 080 screw, but it didn't thread really well. And so I uh, moved up to a number 2 screw. The problem is this wall thickness is not very thick and there's not a lot of threads on there, but the number 2 is a little larger and it actually holds somewhat, which is good. So you can see um, just here, here's the original 080 screw that we had the footage of it being machined and then I got the lathe out again and I did this 256 screw uh, this was actually harder because it was larger and there was more of the screw in the way of the of the bit but we got just enough here turned down to a millimeter diameter that it worked and then I spent some quality time with a small jeweler's file and filed this down to get the right length of thread still left there, which will thread into this hole. Um, because we don't have the wall thickness, I can't just rely on thread locker. So what I'll do is mix up some epoxy, put some on the threads, thread it into the hole, smear a little on the inside here. You can see I did a little uh, filing to try to make more room for the screw. and. Um, and you can see about right here, about halfway through the screw is where this arc would have went through. It's where they made a little more clearance for the uh, plastic gear. So I'll have to file that part down by hand, but we can have some epoxy around the little nub of the screw that sticks through there. And tomorrow, after we give the epoxy time to set up, I'll take the Dremel tool and cut off this section of the screw and hopefully we'll have a repaired uh, pinch roller arm. Okay, here is our pinch roller. Get zoomed in on him. There you, go. you can see I cut the head off the screw. Do just a little grinding with the stone. Right there using the journal tool. And I did test fit it to the mechanism and it clears the, the gear. So it's kind of ugly from that view. But it's the right diameter, it sticks down the right amount, and it looks like it's going to work. So now, we'll just put it back together. Okay, first, try to get this pinch roller in here. Okay. 
you might remember the problem was that when it was pulling back the read right head right here the pinch roller wasn't coming back with it because there was a little nub on the bottom of this arm that had been broken off so we machined a screw and threaded it and epoxied it in there and I just got this back together um, I noticed that the shaft that the cam gear was on had started pulling out so I pushed that back in there and turn on some power here and you'll see that goes in and out like it should now. So that's kind of stopped with it out. So everything's working I believe. So now to replace the caps on the board and then put this mechanism back in and see if it works. Well, I think that about does it for this video. We learned a little bit about convergent technologies. We got to take one of the work slates apart and we even managed to rescue one of the cassette mechanisms by machining a new part for it. In the next episode, we'll concentrate on the electronic repair. We'll replace the electrolytic capacitors and find a replacement for that surface mount inductor that came up missing. Then we'll put it all back together and hopefully it'll work just great and we'll try out some of the training tapes that came with the unit. Say, if you're not already a subscriber, look below for that rectangular subscribe button and click on that guy. Then look for a bell-shaped icon and click on that guy and it'll tell you just as soon as I post a new video. If you like what you see on these videos, please click that like button. I sure appreciate it. If you have comments or questions or something else you'd like me to look into, please leave that in the comments section down below. I sure would appreciate it. Thank you. Until next time, bye.